Hello aspirants, welcome to Daily News Analysis by Shankar IS Academy. The list of topics chosen for today is displayed on the screen. We have also provided page number of these topics in various editions. Interested aspirants can go through them. Now let us begin our discussion. Now look at this article. This article is regarding Silambam. See, according to this article, a sportswoman has won two gold medals in the martial art of Silambam. So in this context, let us learn about Silambam. In addition to Silambam, we'll also discuss some other martial arts of India. Very important topic from prelims as well as mains perspective. See, in prelims, you can expect questions from culture area. Similarly, in mains, GS paper one, you can expect one or two questions from culture. So this topic is very important from that perspective. The syllabus relevant to this article is displayed on the screen. Interested aspirants can go through it. First, let us see about Silambam. See, Silambam is an ancient traditional martial art. Silambam involves the act of fencing. It uses a long staff. Staff means stick. So we can say Silambam is a weapon-based martial art. It uses punching, it uses kicking, knee strikes, elbow strikes and weapon strikes. These are the basic techniques of Silambam. Now let us come to the most important point. Silambam was developed in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. See, in prelims you can expect the correctly matched questions, right? In left side they can give the martial arts and the right side they can give the states. So remember, Silambam was developed in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. See, initially Silambam was used for war. It was used as a defense technique in war. But later it is now used for show purposes. Now it is also used as a self-defense technique. Many people are now learning Silambam as a self-defense technique. See, Silambam is not only found in Tamil Nadu. Its variations can be seen throughout India. For example, take Kerala. In Kerala, we can find Neduvadi. Take Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh, we can find Karasamu. Take Karnataka. In Karnataka, we can find Danta Varisai. In Uttar Pradesh, we can find Lati. In Maharashtra, we can find Marithani. In Gujarat, we can find Dallakadi. In Punjab and Haryana, we can find Patapachi. In Jharkhand and Bikar, we can find Kadga. These are all martial arts which are similar to Silambam. They are almost similar to Silambam, though there are slight variations. So we can see Silambam is one of the important martial arts of India. Culturally, it has a very important place in India. It is mentioned even in Sangam literature. See, Sangam literature is a Tamil literature which was published around 4th century BC. In Sangam literature, you can find the significance of Silambam being mentioned. For example, take Silapadigaram. In Silapadigaram, Silambam is mentioned as the mother of all martial arts. Such is the significance of Silambam. Even the international community is recognizing the martial arts of Silambam. For example, take the year 2019. In 2019, Silambam was declared as non-Olympic sports by the International Non-Olympic Committee, INOC. So we can say that Silambam is internationally recognized as non-Olympic sport. In addition to that, INOC has declared 14th April as International Silambam Day. So we can see that this martial art is getting international recognition. Now let us come to India. See, Indian government has taken several steps to preserve and promote Silambam. For example, take the scheme called IGMA. IGMA stands for Indigenous Game and Martial Arts Scheme. Under the scheme, Silambam has been included by the Sports Ministry. See, IGMA scheme is aimed at preserving and promoting indigenous sports in the country. And under this scheme, the Sports Ministry has included Silambam. So far, IGMA scheme has nine indigenous games disciplines. They are Kalari Payetu of Kerala, Silambam Tamil Nadu, Kabadi Telangana, Archery Jharkhand, Malaka Maharashtra, Mukna, Tangta, Komlanai, Azam, Gatka, Punjab. So these nine sports are included under IGMA. So these are the basic information regarding Silambam. Now let us discuss some other important martial arts of India. We'll discuss about them very briefly. First is Kalari Payetu. See, Kalari Payetu is an ancient martial art indigenous to Kerala. Very important point. Now moving on to Tangta. Tangta is a Manipuri martial art.
moving on to Gatka. Gatka, it is a martial arts of Panja. Gatka was used as self defense by the Sikh warriors. So these are the other important martial arts of India. Kaleri Payetu, Tangta and Gatka. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion we saw about Silambam, the significance of Silambam, the origin of Silambam and the international recognition and the national recognition of Silambam. In addition to that we also discussed about Kaleri Payetu, Tangta and Gatka. Now moving on to the next discussion. Now let us take up this news article for our next discussion. This article is about Norway. First, let us discuss the news mentioned in this article. See, the oil and gas sector is the most important sector of Norway. It is responsible for over 40% of Norway's exports. Also, the oil and gas sector of Norway employs over 5% of the total Norwegian workforce. This is why this sector is very important. It has made Norway one of the wealthiest country in the world. This is the crux of the news in this article. Now, in this context, let us discuss some important points regarding Norway. We learn about Norway from map perspective. It will be beneficial in the upcoming prelims. See, in prelims, you can expect map-based questions. And most of the time, the question is from the places in the news. So with this knowledge in mind, let us discuss about Norway from map perspective. Now look at this map for better understanding. See, as you can see from the map, Norway is a narrow country. It is located in the northern part of Europe. We can also observe that Norway occupies the western half of Scandinavian Peninsula. This is the Scandinavian Peninsula. This peninsula is located in the northern Europe and uh, Norway occupies the western half of the Scandinavian peninsula. In addition to that, we can see Sweden and Finland, which is a part of this peninsula. See, Scandinavian peninsula is the largest peninsula in Europe and Norway is a part of this peninsula. I hope aspirants can follow. Now, coming back to Norway. Now, look at this map about my Norway. We can see the capital is Oslo. It is located in the southern part of the Norway. See, nearly half of the inhabitants of Norway live in the southern part of Norway. It is usually around the Oslo region. Almost 50% of the population is located in the southern region. This is because Norway has extreme climate and it has also difficult terrain. This is why the northern part of Norway is sparsely populated. Almost two-thirds of Norway is mountainous. It experiences difficult terrain. See, when we are talking about Norway, we should also learn about fjords. The spelling is F-J-O-R-D-S, but the pronunciation is fjords. Norway coastline is famous for its fjords. Now, aspirants may have a question. What is a fjord? See, fjord is a sea inlet between cliffs, okay? You can see this picture. We have cliffs on the either side and we have an inlet between the cliffs. This sea inlet is called as fjords. And Norway's coastline is famous for the fjords. These fjords are generally carved by glaciers. Have a look at this picture for better understanding. Now, let us discuss about the boundaries of Norway. What are the countries and water bodies surrounding Norway? See, Norway has Barents Sea in the north. You can see from the map, Barents Sea is located in the north. It has Norwegian Sea and North Sea in the west. And it finally, it has Skager Strait in the south. These are the water bodies surrounding Norway. As you can see from the map, the northern, western and southern part of the Norway are surrounded by water bodies. But it has land borders in the east. Remember, Norway has got land borders only in the east. What are the land borders? Sweden, Finland and Russia. These are the countries bordering Norway in the east. Sweden, Finland and Russia. So these are the important points regarding Norway from map perspective. Now, let us move on to the next part of our discussion. Now look at this article. This article is regarding NatGrid. So let us discuss in brief about NatGrid. NatGrid stands for National Intelligence Grid. See, we all know about Mumbai terror attacks. It happened in 2008. It was one of the worst terror attacks witnessed by India. See, many experts believe that a weakness in intelligence gathering 
was the main reason behind Mumbai terror attacks. So as a solution to this, the project NADGRADE was conceived in 2009. This is the history behind NADGRADE. Mumbai terror attacks 2008. NADGRADE's ultimate aim is to counter terror and terror activities. Now look at this figure. We have NADGRADE in the middle. We have the data providers on the left side and we have the user data on the right side. Now let me explain how NADGRADE works. See, NADGRADE has been created as an IT platform. It will assist the intelligence and law enforcement agencies. See, as you can clearly see from the figure, NADGRADE is in the middle. So it will connect the approved user agencies with the data providers. User agencies in this context mean security or law enforcement agencies. Data providers in this context means airlines, banks, SEBI, railways, telecom industries, whoever can provide information. They are the data providers. So NADGRID will collect the information from the data providers and it will give to the user agencies. This is how NADGRID works. For example, take information like mobile call details, telephone connections, bank account details, passport details, immigration entry and exit data, income tax returns. These kind of information will be available with the data providers. NADGRID will collect the information from the data providers and it will provide this data to the user agencies. As I already said, user agencies are security and law enforcement agencies. These user agencies will collect information from the NADGRID, they will analyze the data and they will prevent the terror attacks. This is how NADGRID works. It is a IT platform. For example, take National Investigation Agency, Intelligence Bureau, Research and Analysis Wing, RAW. These kind of agencies will have access to NADGRID. They will get information from the NADGRID, they will analyze it and they will prevent the terror attacks. See, NADGRID will be an important platform to prevent terror attacks. This is because NADGRID will provide real-time information to the agencies. See, real-time is the actual time during which an event occurs. It is like getting live information. So as soon as the event has taken place, NADGRID will provide information to the user agencies. Imagine getting live updates will have better chances of preventing terror activities, right? This is how NADGRID functions. It provides real-time information. It can play a huge role in preventing terror attacks. It will play a huge role in our national security. But there is a problem. See, we all know about the privacy versus national security debate. This debate is constantly going on. How much privacy can be violated in the name of national security? This dilemma has always persisted. Now, NADGRID is caught up in this debate. Privacy versus national security debate. See, as I already said, NADGRID will have access to a lot of private data. So, these data can be stolen. It can experience data theft. Also, the data with the NADGRID can be misused. So, it is a security breach. So, because of these reasons, many people are questioning the validity of NADGRID. They are raising concerns regarding NADGRID. Sensitive private information could be leaked and they can be misused. Many experts are questioning the data security of NADGRID. So it is the responsibility of Indian authorities to put extra care to ensure the safety of the NADGRID database. So these are the important points regarding NADGRID. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion we saw about NADGRID, how it functions, the origin behind NADGRID and finally we discussed about the issue regarding NADGRID. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Now look at this editorial. This editorial is regarding North Korea nuclear threat. So in this context, let us discuss about nuclear deterrence doctrine. In addition to that, we will also discuss about IAEA. Now let us begin this discussion. The syllabus relevant to this article is displayed on the screen. Interested aspirants can go through it. First, let us see about nuclear deterrence doctrine. See, this doctrine is important from prelims as well as mains perspective. What is nuclear deterrence doctrine? See, in simple language, deterrence means I have weapons, I have powerful weapons. So if you hit me or attack me, I am going to retaliate harder. This is deterrence. So the enemy or the potential threat will not have the audacity to take you for granted. This is what is called deterrence. See, let me explain this with a simple example. Imagine two people fighting in a ground. If they do not have any weapons, then there will be no deterrence. They will keep on fighting. Whereas if one person has gun, then another person will hesitate to hit that person. He will fear that person. He will not have the audacity to take the other person for granted. This is deterrence. The same concept can be applied for nuclear weapons also. When we have a lot of nuclear weapons, 
other countries will not have the audacity to attack us they will be deterred i hope aspirants can follow so we can basically say deterrence is based on two assumptions first my weapons will make you think twice before attacking me second i have weapons so powerful it will cripple you these are the two assumptions behind deterrence and this deterrence method is used in nuclear weapons and it is called as nuclear deterrence doctrine many countries justify their use of nuclear weapons through nuclear deterrence doctrine they use this doctrine as a reason to stockpile many nuclear weapons even india uses this doctrine to justify the stockpiling of nuclear weapons we call this policy as credible minimum deterrence very important keyword credible minimum deterrence you can use it as value addition in your main answer so we can say that many nuclear powers are using the nuclear deterrence doctrine to stockpile nuclear weapons but there's a problem see this doctrine only encourages the stockpiling of nuclear weapons it encourages nuclear proliferation for example one country will have under nuclear weapons so another country will go for 120 nuclear weapons then another country will go for 150 nuclear weapons so it encourages the usage of nuclear weapons it encourages nuclear proliferation the nuclear power will continuously increase the nuclear weapons to show their power this is the major drawback of this doctrine i hope aspirants can follow see so far we saw about nuclear deterrence doctrine Now let us discuss the important points in this editorial. See in recent years North Korea is stockpiling lot of nuclear weapons. They are using this doctrine, they are using the nuclear deterrence doctrine to justify their stockpiling of nuclear weapons. They use this doctrine as an excuse to stockpile a huge quantities of plutonium. They are building lot of nuclear facilities. See this is danger. Now have a look at this map. This map shows the missile reach of North Korea. We can see India is within the range of North Korean missiles. Russia is within the range of North Korean missiles, China, Japan, Canada, United States of America. All these countries are within the reach of North Korean missiles. So this poses a danger. North Korean nuclear missiles can reach these countries. As we all know, North Korea is ruled by a unstable government. It is ruled by a dictator. So it poses a challenge. The United States of America got paranoid about the nuclear build up in North Korea. This is because any missile from Korea can easily reach United States of America. So tensions were building between the two countries. North Korea and the United States of America were almost on the verge of war. But things started changing. Take the year 2019. In this year, a bilateral summit was held between North Korean leader Kim Jong Un and US President Donald Trump. In this bilateral summit, the North Korean leader offered to fully dismantle the nuclear facilities. but in the exchange north korea ask for a complete relief from international economic sanctions see lot of economic sanctions have been imposed on north korea so in exchange north korea ask for relief from international economic sanctions so this summit was a start of peace between north korea and united states of america things were moving in the right direction north korea started to reduce its nuclear facilities but the problem is us did not honor the promise it did not remove the economic sanctions from north korea so to get revenge north korea started building lot of nuclear facilities i hope aspirants can follow see another problem is north korea has kept the nuclear program opaque it does not have a transparent nuclear program north korea keeps its nuclear program hidden from iaea inspections see iaea stands for international atomic energy agency a north korea is not allowing international atomic energy agency to inspect its nuclear program so this has again increased the tensions between north korea and united states of america now countries like india is also worried about north korea because as i already said the missiles of north korea can easily reach india this is the gist of this editorial see before concluding this editorial let us see about international atomic energy agency See International Atomic Energy Agency is a world central intergovernmental forum for cooperation in the nuclear field. This agency is responsible for inspection of nuclear reactors around the world. Now coming back to the editorial, see the North Korean nuclear agenda has got the international community worried. But the new US administration under Joe Biden has taken a more practical route. The new US administration has expressed willingness to resume talks with North Korea. but north korea is not showing any interest north korea wants to remove the economic sanctions only after that it is ready for any talks with united states of america so we have to wait and watch how the things proceeds 
So these are the important points highlighted in this editorial. We have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion, we saw about nuclear deterrence doctrine. We saw about North Korean nuclear program. We also discussed about 2019 bilateral summit, and we also discussed about the rising tensions between U.S. and North Korea. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Now look at this editorial article. This editorial article is regarding U.S.-Afghanistan relationship. Very very important topic from Maine's perspective. See, this editorial article discussion is very important because we'll be discussing about the impacts in India. We will be discussing how the failure of U.S.-Afghanistan relationship has impacted India. Now let us begin this discussion. The syllabus covered by this editorial is highlighted below for your reference. Interested aspirants can go through it. See, before discussing the editorial, first let us have a refreshment. Let us briefly discuss about the events that took place between U.S. and Afghanistan. It will help us to understand this editorial better. See, the U.S.-Afghanistan relationship can be traced back to September 11 attacks. So, when you are writing your main answer, have a rough idea regarding the chronology of events. It will make your thought process organized. It will make your recollection better. See, we all know about the September 11 attacks. It is also called as 9/11 attacks. It caused a lot of destruction to life and property. Almost 3,000 people lost their lives in this attack. And we also know that this attack was planned by Osama bin Laden. He is the leader of Al Qaeda, and he planned this attack. See, after this attack, bin Laden took refuge in Afghanistan. He was protected by the Taliban's in the Afghanistan. and the talibans were refusing to hand over osama bin laden this is where the problem started so following the refusal of talibans the united states of america intervened in the afghanistan it removed taliban from afghanistan to be precise it removed the taliban government from the afghanistan in place of talibans the united states of america placed a democratic government in the afghanistan i hope aspirants can follow but the thing is this move was a failure the democratic government in afghanistan failed and the us withdrew in february 2020 it started withdrawing from afghanistan in february 2020 the united states of america completely departed from afghanistan on august 30 2021 and taliban took control of the country again this is the rough timeline of events i hope aspirants can follow see the 911 attacks took place in 2001 we are now in 2021 So it has been 20 years since the 9/11 attacks taken place. So after 20 year occupation of United States in Afghanistan, again Afghanistan is in the control of Taliban. We are back to the square zero. So in this context, this editorial has been written. Now let us discuss the important points in this editorial. See, first of all, according to the author of this editorial, the United States of America decision to leave Afghanistan is not a good idea. He is against it. According to the author. This decision of United States of America has made the world less safe. It can lead to high chances for the spread of transnational terrorism. Very important keyword: transnational terrorism. Terrorism which can threaten multiple countries across regions. This terrorism is called as transnational terrorism. And according to the author, the U.S. decision to leave Afghanistan will increase the spread of transnational terrorism. See, after the 9/11 attacks, United States of America took a resolution. it launched a global war on terrorism it not only invaded afghanistan it launched a global war on terrorism see this global war on terror is a american led global counter terrorism campaign through this campaign america targeted extremist groups located throughout the muslim world but the thing is this initiative did not yield tangible results we can say it is almost a failure this is a first important point conveyed by the author of the editorial United States of America by withdrawing from Afghanistan is going against the global war on terror it can lead to spread of transnational terrorism now moving on to the second point see according to the author United States of America is not learning from the past lessons to be precise it is not learning from the lessons of the 9/11 attacks this is because many United States presidents like Joe Biden Obama Donald Trump has called Taliban as good terrorist they are trying to create distinction between the terrorist groups they have classified taliban as good terrorist whereas they have classified isis al qaeda aqwani network as bad terrorist but according to the author these distinctions are misleading because many terrorist organizations have interlinked networks they are entwined they don't operate alone 
So according to the author, classifying terrorist as good terrorist and bad terrorist will create a lot of problem. It will be misleading and it will act against the global war on terror. This is another important point highlighted in this editorial. According to the author of the editorial, US should not draw distinctions between terrorist groups. It can only result in failure. Instead of differentiating the terrorist groups, United States of America should target all terrorist cells and networks irrespective of the place or region. This is the important solution given in this editorial. Do not classify terrorists. They should be equally targeted. Only such a strategy can help in achieving enduring results. I hope aspirants can follow. Now let us move on to the most important topic. How it impacts India. How the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and Taliban control of Afghanistan impacts India. Very important. You can use it as value addition in your main answer. See India is in a tough situation. because india is a close partner to america and india is also near afghanistan we are geographically located nearer to afghanistan and pakistan so we have to balance both these issues and with the reemergence of taliban india is likely to face more loss than gains this is because taliban's encourage terrorism they have made afghanistan as a epicenter for terrorism so india's close proximity to afghanistan will create problems terrorist incidents in india can increase The Afghanistan and Pakistan nexus will increase terror incidents in India. So India will be negatively impacted from the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. There is also another problem. See China is ready to work in close with Taliban. They have supported the Taliban government in Afghanistan. So China will take control in Afghanistan. It will have another country under its control. This is a problem for India. We will be surrounded by Chinese allied countries. So this puts us in a tricky situation. These are the important points highlighted in this editorial. So finally the author of the editorial concludes by saying we have to address these changes in a strategic manner. We should not take any hasty decisions. We have more to lose. So we have to approach this problem in a strategic manner. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion we saw about the events that took place between US and Afghanistan. We discussed about the consequence of US withdrawal from Afghanistan, spread of transnational terrorism. We also discussed about the problems associated with classification of terrorist, good terrorist, bad terrorist, those concepts, how it affects the results, and finally we discussed about the impacts of India. How US withdrawal from Afghanistan and Taliban reemergence will affect India. What are the negative consequences we will face? Now let us move on to the next discussion. Now moving on to reference articles. Look at this article. This article is regarding elephant corridors. Interested aspirants can go through our May thirty first daily news analysis. May thirty first two thousand twenty one. In this news analysis, we have discussed about elephant corridors in great detail. Interested aspirants can go through it. Now moving on to the next article. The next article is regarding Chief Justice of India. We have talked about Chief Justice of India in great detail. in a march 25th daily news analysis so go to march 25th 2021 daily news analysis you can get all relevant information regarding chief justice of india appointment process removal process powers and functions all those basic details you can find in that daily news analysis video now next topic next topic is regarding chief minister appointment march 27th 2021 the daily news analysis on this day as all relevant information regarding chief minister's appointment removal powers and functions interested aspirants can go through that video now let us move on to practice prelims questions first question with reference to india's culture and tradition what is common to the terms kalari payattu silambam tangta gatka a music tradition in northwest india b traditional martial arts of india c classical vocal music in south india d Pictra Dura tradition of India. The correct answer is B. Traditional martial arts of India. Kalari payattu silamam tangta gatka. As we discussed in the article discussion, they are the traditional martial arts of India. The correct answer is option B. Now moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements regarding national intelligence grid. Nat grid. First statement. It is an IT platform to assist the intelligence and law enforcement agencies in ensuring national and internal security. with an ultimate aim to counter terror second statement it is an attached office under ministry of defense which of the statements given above are incorrect see they are asking the incorrect statements a one only b two only c both one and two d neither one nor two see the first statement is correct nat grid is it platform to assist the intelligence and law enforcement agencies in ensuring national and internal security 
since they are asking incorrect statements we can eliminate statement 1 so a is eliminated c is also eliminated now moving on to second statement it is an attached office under ministry of defense this statement is wrong natcred is attached office under ministry of home not ministry of defense since the question is asking incorrect statement the correct answer is option b two only only the second statement is incorrect Nine practice questions are displayed on the screen. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post in the comment section below. If you like this video, click like. If you want to post a comment, post a comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayer's Academy channel. Thank you. All the best.